Hello and welcome along to the Panto Podcast. Merry Christmas, everyone. Christmas Day 2020. We're not going to mention the year again, are we? No, no, no. But my guest for today's Panto Podcast and this special gift to you is Richard Cadell. And there's a hint of sooty, if you can listen out for him. And, of course, sweep. Richard tells me how being on stage for a song sheet when he was a child created this fairy tale world for him, his love of magic, the advantages of owning a private beach, and the harsh realities of being a producer. I'd just like to say thank you very much for listening, for your support, your likes, your retweets, your comments, your messages. They're like applause, so thank you. So please sit back and enjoy this special Christmas edition of the Panto Podcast. My guest for today's Panto Podcast is Richard Cadell. Hello, Richard. Hey, I just said, let's do it. And you, went, you, you, just, you just did it. We're on. We're on the air. Oh, it's uh, a joy to be here. Oh, it really is beautiful. Thank you for inviting me to your lovely home as well. So how did you actually get started off in the business? As a panto performer or just generally? Just generally. Well, we're in my little office now, surrounded by all my paraphernalia, and up on the wall there is a series of ventriloquist dolls. They're plastic toys. They're not the, the real deal. They were made in the 1970s. And the one dressed in the buttons costume in the centre I got for Christmas when I was about five. And that kind of triggered... And there it still is, because I kept it all these years and finished up using it in panto, hence the buttons redress. So I kind of have been given puppets from an early age. I had a Punch and Judy set when I was uh, about five or six as well. Um, and, and a Sooty and Sweep uh, set of puppets, which was quite profound to have as a child. I had a magician to my party who became a lifelong friend when I was about four or five. And all these things collided. And I just got this obsession with, with performing. I was... Blessed in as much my mother was a professional actress, so she encouraged that element in me and my sister, uh, who's a professional actress now. And so my mum en encouraged the performing and took me to little shows and I was doing kids parties and things before I was 10 and doing my little magic tricks and puppet shows. Um, so I really have been doing it, really. My earliest memory is kind of performing, really, ever since I was a child, because... Um, it started, say, with my mum encouraging me and, and with those toys that I got as a, as a Christmas present. And the magic itself, what was it that was so important about seeing that first sort of magic show? Um, I just knew I wanted to be the guy doing it, not the kid getting the breakaway wand in their <laughs> hand. I wanted to be the one doing the breakaway wand. I think a lot of magicians, uh, and I was a professional, still am a professional magician before I became known for Sooty, a lot of magicians um, get drawn to it, particularly as kids, because you're able to do something your friends can't. And if you are not particularly the most popular kid in the class, suddenly you can become a bit interesting if you can make something disappear or vanish or, you know. And, and I think I loved the fact that I took these tricks to school and A, my Teachers encouraged me to do them in little shows and things. On a Friday afternoon, everyone did a bit of a performance. I would always do a trick. Um, and my friends suddenly found me interesting, you know. Um, and a lot of magicians do start from that background, that they, they find it's a good social tool as a kid. And I think that was the case for me. So pantomime, did your mum take you to see many? Yes. Um, you know, and, and a profound moment was... Uh, at the Little Theatre in Leicester, which I'm now the patron of, or one of the patrons, which is lovely. And I was, again, all about the same age, five or six, and I got up on the, the song sheet. Simple Simon had me sing, along with the other five or six kids, um, there's a tiny house by a tiny stream. And I got a packet of jelly tots as the prize, and I wouldn't open these jelly tots. I just kept them, and I wanted Simple Simon to come to my birthday party. And I said to my mum, we must invite Simple Simon. And, and he didn't come to the birthday party when I was... My birthday's in March, so Panto was obviously sort of January or something. Mm. So, um, and that was my first kind of... You know, I just felt this, this fairy tale world as a child uh, that, that, that we all experience. And I've never forgotten that. I, and I don't want to jump forward 40 years, but I just feel it's relevant. I was, um, last the last panto I did 
was playing Buttons in Nottingham last year for Kudos, and we did that amazing thing at the end of Act One where that twins coach and ponies flies over the audience and I'm sat on the front there with Cinders mm. in front of me and we're all waving at everybody and I remember waving at this uh, bunch of little girls and I'm probably going to well up when I say this um, they were crying these little these three little girls probably seven or eight years old were crying with happiness hands in front of their face because Cinderella was going to the ball and it made me cry on that coach because we, we should never underestimate as panto performers what triggers we're, 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 we're igniting in those children's imaginations. And, you know, just for a moment, you're part of giving them that. And I remember the moment that Simple Simon gave me that, that life-changing moment. And um, we should never underestimate what we're doing. And, and sometimes we do, we get a bit self-centred or we get a bit indulgent with the gags. But that was a moment where you could really see the child's faces and now as I flying over their heads and just thought, how lucky am I? And and I cried with those kids. I just thought, this is, this is fairy tale. This is not the real world. This oh. is where I want to be <laughs> forever. <laughs> Did you ever find out then who that simple Simon was? No, I didn't. I didn't. <laughs> and he never came to the party wherever you are. <laughs> Little Theatre 1972. How dare you? But yeah. What an impression though he made on you. The whole panto did. Mm. You know, um... Yeah, but it, it does, doesn't it? It is a fairy tale world. It's complete escapism. That's why we do it, and that's why we fell in love with it. So, Sooty, how did he come into your life? Oh, gosh. The thing is, there's so much, it's so much, it's hard to compact everything. I'm 52 <laughs> now, and I've done it for, oh, geez, 40, you know, half a century nearly, and it's to, to get it all is in. That how long it's been with you? Well, I've not done Sooty for half a century. Oh. No, that would be lucky. Sooty is over 70 years old, Harry Corbett created it of course did it for 20 something years Matthew Corbett did it for 25 years this is my 21st year of doing it um, so I had been working professionally as a magician um, I had been presenting big illusions which was my thing and quite at that time unusual so I'm going back 20 years hence but more than 25 years when summer seasons as we knew them Blackpool Grand and all those Torquay Princess, Weymouth Pavilions and Bridlingtons and all of those existed and I was doing the Blackpool Grand Theatre for what is now Kudos um, and doing all my big illusions in what was the last ever summer show that even then it was probably the last surviving summer show it was their last ever production show with dancers and special acts and, and the top of the bills and it, that was the last year and I remember my agent at the time um a brilliant man who I owe so much to called Stanley Dallas, one of the Dallas boys that was back in the day and, and became an amazing agent. And I remember him saying, well, you know, there are, there are no more theatres really left, kid. You know, you might do Butlins next year. I said, but Stan, I can't do my big stuff at Butlins. I can't do my motorcycle, my water tank. And he said, well, you have to downsize. And, and suddenly I thought, well, I'm going to be doing everything that everyone else does, you know, and I, I can't do this. So I thought, that's it. I'm going to pack it in and I'm going to st stop being an illusionist. Um, I had another business at the time as well, which was doing quite well. I was in partnership with my, with my brother and he said, look, you've had a go. You did well. You can still do panto every Christmas, but you've got to stop. You've got to come, you know, forget the illusions. It's, a, you know, it's finished. And he was true. Um, so I packed it all in. I sold a lot of the props and I was just resigned myself to being, you know, buttons at Christmas or whatever was thrown at me um, and just being, you know, uh, sort of almost a semi-pro really and then Stanley Dallas phoned me up and I remember him saying and the story is this is the truth um, it's I got so much detail I don't want to go into because it just takes so long but my other business we had an amusement park I've always been in the funfair business and uh, we hadn't got buckets of money so we had to buy rides that were going cheap and stuff and we got the opportunity of buying a steel roller coaster in Sweden from a park that was closing down but to get it at the price we had to go and strip it down ourselves me and my brother went there and Sweden the temperatures are like minus four in the their winters are cold and when you're at the top 40 foot in the air with a monkey wrench trying to undo a bolt it ain't fun so we were at the top of this thing and I was sweating it was the hardest work I've probably ever done we were taking this roller coaster down and I got this miss called Stanley Dallas in the middle of the winter and the freezing thing don't forget I told my brother that I was packing in the illusions I was coming back to help him with the amusement park and Stanley said are you sitting down he said Matthew Corbett's retiring they want someone to replace him and you're in the frame and I 
just but it was it was a real kind of curveball for me because I'd never imagined doing it and I'd never imagined that that job would ever be available it was always going to be Matthew Corbett you know um so I sort of couldn't quite believe what I was saying. I just remember my brother saying, don't you think you're going to abandon me with this roller coaster? <laughs> you said you'd buy this roller coaster. So I had to finish stripping the roller coaster down. And then uh, after a series of screen tests and auditions, um, I was announced as Matthew's replacement. And I cried my eyes out because it was just a life-changing moment um, to have grown up watching the Sooty Show on TV. Even now, I've done it 20 years and when I'm on stage with Sooty and Sweep, I still look at them and think, I'm actually doing this. This is me doing this. Hang on, hang on a minute. This is me doing it. Am I actually yeah. doing this? Um, it still gets me because they were part of my childhood, you know? Um, so I still don't quite believe after 20 years that that these characters are kind of mine, really, which is almost presumptuous to say. I feel almost <laughs> like I shouldn't say it, but they are. and and And... Uh, it's almost still unbelievable, but there you go. And you appeared on the show as well, didn't you, in your younger years? Yep. Uh, <laughs> there's a trophy over there. You can see it on my table there. It's uh, the Young Magician of the Year trophy. I got that when I was 15. And part of the prize, as well as that trophy, was to go on Blue Peter and, uh, and some Saturday morning kids show and the Sooty Show. So I went on the Sooty Show and did a magic trick. And it's on YouTube somewhere. Someone's dug it up and put it up there, and it's <laughs> often referred to because I've got horrendous mullet haircut, and and uh, the trick's not very good that I do. But nevertheless, um, yes, made an appearance on that show. That's where I met Matthew Corbett and the team, and I was in awe of it. And as a fan, I did make the effort to sort of get to know everybody, not because I was trying to ferret my way in there. I was just enthralled by it all. So years later, when he was retiring. They, they actually said, well, we need a magician because it needs to be someone that can, can manipulate things with his hands. And who do we know? It's a magician who we had on the show. And um, it was because of that. They said, well, what Richard Cadell's doing these days? And that's how it all fell into place. And then my agent, Stanley, was doing deals with Granada. And they said, have you heard of a guy called Richard Cadell? I said, yes, I have. And I'm, <laughs> yeah, I look after him and blah, blah. And so it went on, you know. Everything just sort of fell into place. Yeah, I mean, it was hard work. It wasn't an easy gig. They 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 screen tested me and they auditioned me along with a few other people. They they, you know, they were aligning a human with a very trusted iconic brand, and they had to be not only sure, I suppose, that you could deliver the material on screen and stage, but they had they went right into my life. You know, they don't want to align Sooty and find out the person they've made the face of Sooty, uh, you know, has some awful history that's going to tarnish that clean brand. So mm. they went right into it. It was. Uh, was involved and so when I got it it was a huge relief of course it's different these days because I own all the rights now I mean I, I didn't own the rights when I got the job I never bought the rights and became Mr Sooty I, I was cast and I presented the show for sort of eight or nine years um, before they announced they were going to sell the rights and at that point me and my brother said okay we're going to buy them or we're going to have a good go at buying them and we were successful and we bought them yeah so going back what was more important the actual theme parks and fun fairs that you were involved with or the magic at that time? I have a love of both businesses and I was very lucky I was able to dip in and out of performing and dip in and out of the fun park and you know um, sort of simultaneously build both things. Um, I still have rides to this day I sold the amusement park back in 2014 but I still have a traveling ghost train I have a cyclone twist a hall of mirrors and they travel with Carter's steam fair um, I have all the lorries and all the nonsense and the big showman's yard. So I, that's very much in my blood. As you, we sit here in my office, I've got slot machines <laughs> and amusement arcade. I've got my own games room full of slot machines, bubblegum machines. So amusements have always been very core to my and sort of uh, to, to central to me. And, and there is a tandem. It's all showmanship. It's all selling smiles. You know, nobody walks away with. They come to see a pantomime. They, they walk away with nothing but laughs and memories. Same when they go to a fun fair. They walk away with laughs and memories. It's good business. Good markup. You know, <laughs> but uh, but I love it. I do. It. I've never done it for money. I've always done everything for passion. You know, and and I'm fortunate enough to have made a crust at it at the same time. So yeah, I'm still. If I had to pick. I don't know. You know. I'm never going to retire, so when I cark it, I'll either be running the ghost train or, or, or churning out the same old gags I've been doing for 30 years. What was it then with the... What started off then, the fun fair? Oh, Hayden, this is such a long story. <laughs> oh, well, it's all sort of happens. I, it's, again, it's, it happens as a kid. You know, my dad was a doctor to a couple of showmen. He used to take us to the fair, the local fair. 
And again, I just fell in love with it and always knew that I wanted to be part of it, not not going. And showmen are a very insular community um, and they are made up of some of the hardest working, most talented people. Because to be a successful showman, you have to be all things. You have to be a good mechanic, you have to be able to weld, you have to be able to paint, you have to be able to uh, drive, you have to be able to physically assemble these things, which are hard, and then you have to put on a smile and brush up and clean up and serve the public well and do all that. Come on, boys and girls, jump on, which is the showman thing, to take more money than everybody else. They don't do it for the fun of it, they do it because they can take more money. Then you have to pack up and move. It's a hard life, and these people are often underestimated and they do keep themselves to themselves so when an outsider wants to enter the business it's very difficult it's very difficult to get in um so i think it was just sheer persistence when i left school i was working in a holiday camp as a green coat doing my magic show dj and keep fit i did everything um everything rather <laughs> I could hear my mother from up above saying speak correctly everything <laughs> um yeah slipping a bit there and uh, uh and 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 i i always wanted a ghost train that was my big passion ghost trains and i remember saving up all the money i earned in the holiday camp um a few thousand quid by the end of the season i bought this dilapidated old ghost train from a showman that was falling to pieces and i found a farmer a great guy a lifelong friend now called Richard Howes who had in the, uh, a small leisure centre at the time in Breen which is where we're sat now where I live and I said can I bring my ghost train this was when I was 17 nearly 18 I mean I look back on it think how did I do that how at the time I thought was that? a man but you know you're just a child <laughs> can I bring my ghost train to uh, to your um, uh, leisure centre and I'll work for you as a DJ so he was great said yes so I did all the kids shows DJing in the evening and then I'd run my ghost train outside in the day and but I, I sort of did okay with the ghost train and basically that site where I had the ghost train became and now is Breen theme park and we turned that me and my brother my brother was four years younger he left school came and joined me and we turned that from a piece of gravel to a um, you know 30 ride 70 stuff tourist attraction and it took us 30 years of passion and love and building stuff ourselves and making it and buying old rides refurbishing them and then when we could afford them buying new rides and um it was a great journey and all the time i'd be you know building so and just sort of sidetracking so i don't shut up do i hey this is easy for you this one <laughs> yeah, it's it's an interview it's your interview well as as I'm not, apologies if i'm boring everyone <laughs> apologies it's wonderful but here's the thing so here's another turning point for sooty and if anyone's not watched the current Sooty show that I present, it's on ITV every single day on, on ITVB, around about 9.15, 9.40. They sometimes move the times. Uh, or you can see it on YouTube, just search the Sooty show. It's set on an amusement park. The story of this, the amusement park is my amusement park. That's where we filmed it, when we still owned it. And after we'd sold it, we still filmed there. Um, and the story with this is that when I had bought the rights for Sooty, it was ITV had, had stopped making it for a few years. And I went back to the head of children's ITV and said, I want to make it again. And they went, oh, it's a bit old fashioned. Do we really want to go there again? You know, I said, no, it'll be great. They said, we'll go and make a pilot. So I made a pilot uh, called The Big Day Out, which was the first thing I'd ever made myself. But previously I'd worked for the, the people that owned the rights. I'd bought the rights. Now this is my first venture. We called it The Big Day Out. It's on YouTube. We took it back to ITV and they watched it and they really liked it. And I was with my agent at the time, Michael Vine, and uh, he uh, was, we were sat there together. And I remember this lady who was in charge ultimately, and she said, oh, that looks, this is brilliant. She said, but that location must have cost a fortune. <laughs> and I went, well, as a matter of fact, it just was about to say, it's my location. I sort of got this kick from Michael. I said, be quiet, don't say anything. Cause, uh -huh. But that's where we shoot the TV series. The whole premise is that I live on a, work on a holiday camp, which is drawn from my original experiences. So it's a bit Heidi High, I'm wearing the blue coat and the tie and the jacket. I work for a fictitious boss that we never see. And it's all set on the amusement park and everything goes wrong. Great setting for all sorts of things. I mean, the, the plot lines are endless because it's just so easy to write on that in that scenario. We have the beach. Can I keep talking? I've got a little story. We're sat in my office. We're overlooking the beach. My house backs onto the beach. And when I bought this house, on the deeds, I got to see that I owned the bit of beach. Wow, I owned the beach all the way to the sea. But the reality is you have to pay the council to keep it clean and you have to let all the public use it. So it's not worth a jot, but you do technically own it. 
So when we came to film the Sooty Show, we do a lot of scenes on the beach because we're by the seaside and it looks amazing to have that backdrop. So when we first pitching up <laughs> and then, you know, we were just about to shoot the first scene of many on the beach at the back of my garden. And we were using my house as a bit of a, you know, teas and coffees and what have you. And woo, woo, sirens going, woo, 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 beach warden. Ah, 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 you can't film here without permission. I went, oh, hang on, stand back. <laughs> yes, I can. This is my beach. <laughs> and it was like, yes, now I've finally monetized my investment on the beach. So, yeah, so that, that, that's so we shoot it all by the seaside. So, um, we film it all remotely. Anyway, I've gone off topic. I don't know what you asked me. Ask me another question. Entertaining, then, who's been your big influences over the years? Oh, crikey, there's been so many. I mean, I have been lucky enough to do so much, work with so many incredible people. Um, I it would be wrong to single people out. I think, as an influence, I'm not so much as, you know, and anyone who's listening that's a performer probably will get this, you know, having the talent to do stuff. There's lots of people that can do it and they've got, can, can, there's lots of people with talent. But for me, the biggest lesson was just being nice. And, and, and being part of a team and, and especially in a panto where you're thrown together with people you don't know and by New Year's Eve they're your best friends and they're like your family and then you leave them again in general you know it's this weird little environment this 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 unusual um, thing which is just always associated with pantos so it's really important to get on and Norman Barrett of Blackpool Tower ringmaster fame and with the most beautiful beautiful act with budgies was just for me a real lesson in how to be a team player and I did a panto with him early 2002 or something I don't know maybe 20 years ago maybe it's not quite that long ago but I just remember thinking I am learning from you you have you come in every morning you speak to everyone from the the, the, the little runner the, the 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 ASM the props guys you know all their names you make the effort with everybody you know, you're not top of the bill, but you are making the effort with everybody right from the top to the middle. You know all their names and, you know, this is the way. And it just set the benchmark for a happy show. And how many pantos have we been in when you get someone that throws a bit of a wobbler and then someone else does? And it all makes it all a bit. But when you've got someone being just not trying, but just just nice and polite and respectful, it sets the tone. And I learnt, I think that's probably the most important lesson I learnt. Forget performing. It was that. Norman Barrett, I've always said the nicest man in show business. And he is, in my opinion. What was your first experience on treading the boards in pantomime? Um, and why did you want to do it as well? Oh, <laughs> why did I want to do it? Come on, I was the little boy on stage, you know, fell in love with, with Simple Simon and, and, and that whole, um, you know, that whole world. I, my world changed when I met a man who became like a father to me, and I know people who know him or knew him will listen to this, and they'll know what I mean. His name was Brian Geary, and he presented an amateur pantomime at the Hinkley Concordia Theatre just outside Leicester. And when he passed away, which was probably one of the worst days of my life, on his grave it says Mr Pantomime, he put on the most spectacular shows. Amateur is not a state of, 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 uh, of um, what's the word I'm looking at? Excellent. I'm not, let me say this right. Being an amateur does not mean that it's not, not as good as being professional. It just means you don't do it for a living. So just because it was an amateur production, the, the standards were far in excess of some of the professional shows I've been in, mm. far in excess, and still are, I hasten to add, because um, John Hill, who has carried the, the baton on, does just as good a job. But Brian was an amazing inspiration to me and he came to see me do a pantomime uh, do a sorry do a children's party and cast me as idol jack in dick whittington in his panto and i learned so much from being in that show so much from him a great team a brilliant cast amazing special effects i mean like just ahead of its time and for an amateur show it's crazy it sold out you can never get a ticket ever and it ran for 3 weeks or something crazy um and i remember at the end of it i was 15 
I remember walking down the steps from the stage down to the dressing rooms and crying my eyes out that it had finished. And I fell into Brian's arms and he was a big no-nonsense man. You know, he wasn't your lover. He was all right, all right, my rich, you're bloody hell. And he would swear in front of the juveniles' mothers and <laughs> it'll be pulling faces. He was a proper, a proper bloke, you know. And I remember throwing my arms around him, crying my eyes out. He says, what are you crying for, you know? I said, it's, it's finished, you know, it's finished. And I remember him looking at me saying, no, son. He said, it's not the end, it's the beginning. And my eyes lit up and I thought, yeah, I'm going to do this every year and that was it so Brian Geary without question and I'm, next year I came back and did panto for him again I did two or three for him yeah when it comes to pantomime nothing will come close to to what he taught me and another guy as well I, I must mention someone that came into the frame further down the line I only did one year for him Basil Critchley Basil Critchley owned Albemarle um, who produced pantomimes and Basil played buttons for many years professionally. By the time I worked for him, he was older and he wasn't performing, and he showed me how to do his buttons. And I learnt buckets from Basil Critchley. Um, buckets, pathos. Pathos in buttons. I, 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 buttons is the most wonderful character because he's given that opportunity for pathos. And I hate to see it when comics throw that opportunity away or the script is written that doesn't allow the comic to have that isn't it wonderful to make everybody laugh be the focus of the laughs and then to make them cry or to make the little if you can really do it and basil had little tricks and techniques and looks and the way you move and the way you stand and the, 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 the pauses and he just gave me all of that on a plate and he just did it for me and i i copied him he wanted me to copy him he wanted me to do what he did and i did it and by jingos it worked and and i always think of basil whenever i'm playing buttons or I have that love interest but I don't get the girl. I use all the Basil Critchley moves and, and looks and yeah, there you go. Is there any video of him? A Basil Critchley? Mm. I don't know. Albemarle Costumes, um, which was his wife Kim, I think that in Tunbridge Wells, I mean, she would have it. I don't, I don't know, it's years since I've spoken to them. The last time I saw Basil, I was directed because I, I formed my own panto company and I directed panto. For, for, uh, is, as well I directed Danny LaRue and Stephen Mulhern in Cinderella how, how do you Croydon. direct Danny LaRue you don't direct Danny LaRue <laughs> <laughs> he directs you and then everyone's got a Danny story so I got, I've got a great one but we're here all week um, but yeah that was a, but I, he came to see that because I'd, I'd given Stephen Mulhern a couple of Basil's moves but Stephen's so good he probably didn't really need them mm. but, um, but Basil came yeah and that's when I think I last saw him what made you want to get into the whole pantomime directing and producing business? Um, well, and there's a lesson here. There's a lesson to be learned <laughs> to all you turns <laughs> listening. Like everybody else, I thought, well, there's millions of pounds to be made here. <laughs> Anyone can do this. Anyone, you know, I can do this. And um, I, I just reached a point where I just thought I'd like to have a go. I'm a bit entrepreneurial. And at the same time, I'd worked for Barry Stead, who had partnered with Jim Davidson for years and, and Apollo and produced some of the biggest shows. I mean, his Barry C. Stead as a producer, you know, goes back decades and the biggest and best he'd done. And he, I'd worked for him and we became sort of pals. And he'd had an association, I think, with Apollo or Kudos or something and it had finished. And he was, we were just talking and I said, why don't we do it? But oh yeah, I don't want to do it all again. I said, come on, we could do this. And I sort of talked him into a partnership and suddenly he said, yeah, okay, let's do it. So we became duo entertainment, me and Barry said, I was very proud to be aligned with the name like Barry who had all the connections. And, and, and so I did the artistic stuff and he did the deals and, and it was brilliant. But I'm going to tell you, it ain't as easy as you think. It's not as easy. And I learned something, which is why I appreciate what I do now, which is just perform. And I look at the kudos operation in awe. And I'm sure all the other companies are just as, uh, you know, deserve to be looked on in just the same way. Because the organisation that goes into putting on a show, the licences for the juveniles, casting, the dancers, the, 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 the organised rehearsals, the hiring of the sets, the making the sets fit the right size, the lighting plots, the budgets, the, the pyrotechnics, the, the, it goes on and on, the music, the PRS, the, the, it goes on and on and on. And you can spend a year doing the publicity and planning and working with the theatre and doing the deals and the merchandise and the, the programme. There's a typo on page three and, and it goes on and on and on. You can spend a year planning these three weeks 
and well it did take a year and does take a year and there's a turn when I play buttons and I and I know everybody listening or people who perform they they do three weeks of work on the panto and they think when they walk down the finale steps that they own the show and it's all for them <laughs> I used to think like that. I used to walk down, hey, they're all cheering for me, aren't I? Clever, this is our show. And when performers change things, they do something different than the director because they know better. And all these things. Hang on a minute, I've been the other side of it. How dare you change that? And how dare you think that applause is all for you? That's for the 11 months a year behind the scenes of making you look good and making your shoes the right size and your costumes fit perfectly and that scenery be freshly painted and the lighting guy that's been designing and the guy in the pit that's been writing that music since March. And nobody, the turns don't appreciate, or I didn't, certainly some of them I'm sure do. Um, I hope turns isn't a derogative uh, expression. I class myself as a turn. But I didn't appreciate that work until I'd been part of the sweat and the toil and the driving and the meetings and the continual challenges and making the budgets work. And then let me tell you this. I don't know how Kudos and the likes can put on the spectacular shows they put on and really make big money. It's all a myth. I'm sure they make a profit. Do not kid yourself. No one's making fortunes in the pantomime business. Not if they're doing it properly. Not if they're putting the money on the stage, which so many people do. I know because I produced them. And I know what I finished up with. And what we and Barry Stead was a genius at producing. And I know what we finished up with. And you know, you have to love it to want to do it. You have to love it. You can't. It's not a business. It, it, you, there's a little bit left in it. But please, you know, people who think, oh, there's millions of pounds being made and the producers are walking around with you. It just ain't this, It ain't so. It's an illusion. Just I used to walk out on the stage to half empty auditoriums sometimes. And you don't think your wage packet is related to all those empty seats. You think there's a big magic pot that they've all got millions of pounds to pay you. Um, but actually, now I've done the producer side of things. When I was in the shows I was producing, I used to walk out and see the empty seats and think, how are we going to pay the wages this week? You know, And we were in good shows with good names. You think, how are we going to cover the wages? OK, well, we've got an advance, so hopefully we can... And it, it's very much like that. Um, and sometimes you lose money. You know, We have five or six shows, some of them would lose. And you'd have one that would make a bit, and that would kind of cover the losses on the other one. And, and I'd say we were working with people like Barry Stead, experienced, very, very thorough producers. Um, you know, uh, it, it ain't easy. So all I'm saying is when we get the privilege of putting on the frocks and walking out to a band or a nice music in front of scenery, we are the lucky ones. And get a wage at the end of the week. We are the lucky ones. So, you know, I take my hat off to all the producers, really. What was it like working with Danny then? <laughs> Danny LaRue! <laughs> <laughs> uh, what a thing. I directed his last of a panto, so that is... Uh, uh, something I'm very proud of. You just had to let him do his thing, really. You couldn't really direct him, if I'm honest. Um, <sighs> but then people came to see him, didn't they? Mm. Sold tickets and they wanted to see Danny being Danny. What can I say? I mean, there's so many stories. But, uh, and I got, you know, I could, there's one I've got which goes on forever. But I think the moment that I'll take from that experience was getting back from lunch early. And Danny was elderly then, and he wasn't the best on his feet, so often he wouldn't go out for lunch. He'd sit in the rehearsal room, and uh, he'd have a little sandwich or something that he'd bring with him and sit by himself quietly in the corner. And one of the um, other acts in the show had bought in a Danny LaRue annual from the 70s that he wanted Danny to sign. And it was pictures of Danny looking amazing in his prime. And I just came in, and I don't think Danny had even really was aware I'd come back. It was just me in the room and him the other side of the room in the corner. And he was staring at these pictures of himself and then flipping a page and staring again at another picture of himself, you know, looking amazing. And, and here was this elderly, and he put on a lot of weight by that point, guy looking at these, studying them. And I sort of snuck over to him and sat next to him and said, Danny what do you think when you look at all these amazing pictures and he looked at me and 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 just quietly and sincerely said i've done some wonderful things and he was very content and that was you know that was a nice moment i mean everyone's got a crazy story about some of the outrageous things he did <laughs> but that was just you know him looking back with pride quietly yeah <laughs> There you go. <laughs> Would you ever like to be a baddie? 
I'd love to be a baddie. I would love it. I'd love to be. I'll never get cast as King Rat. I'd never get cast. I'd love to be evil, but I couldn't be evil with Sooty, could I? It wouldn't work. I'm too Mr. Nice Guy. But maybe one day when I'm older, yeah, I'd love to be a baddie. I don't know. I'm just seeing now. You're, we're, we're talking now after you know all of this lockdown business, and you're quite, how can I put this, well built, shall I say? Um, <laughs> you mean fat? No, 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 as in. Uh, Hench, I believe, is what the, Thank term, you the kids, very much. The kids yes. say these days. Hench. I have my gym regime and my protein and portions. I, yes. I could just imagine you coming out there with the with the sword or the Captain Hook or I, I don't know. I think the, and the beard because <laughs> I'm not used beard. to not used to seeing you with a beard <laughs> either. You know, well, I've had a bit of time off, haven't I? So I thought I'd try a new look. Um, I don't know. They're never going to cast me as a baddie, are they? But I'd love to have a go. You know, there's one time I thought I'd love to put a frock on. Now I'd, I'd love to because I'd love to play. I like dames when they're played like blokes. I thought I wonder if I could get away with it, but then I think I'd be the worst looking woman, <laughs> so I'm not going to do it. Um, but yeah, no, I, I, I'd do anything. Um, I think I'd love to have a go at everything. So maybe one day um, I'd have a go at a baddie, but I think in the short term I'm going to be forever that cheeky chappy with the little bear. You know, the little bear. Then when did you first bring him into pantomime? Well. As a matter of fact, um, I think Sooty had done Panto with Matthew Corbett, but never with Matthew. For me, it was a very natural thing. So I'd done Panto every year. Suddenly I was cast as Sooty's presenter and the new owners didn't know how to get into Panto. And that's when I worked for Barry Stead because I'd worked for Barry as a sort of a, as a comic and, and a magician. And I said to the new owners, phone Barry Stead and see if he's got a panto and put me in Croydon with Wim Calvin and uh, a couple of other uh, people, a gladiator and Nadia Svahala, I think, from Loose Women. I can never say her second name properly. <laughs> and, um, and I was Aladdin. Um, and that was the start of it, I think. Then every year we'd do panto. Then I was became managed by John Conway. And of course, jumped straight into the Kudos AMG shows as they were. And they really maxed out on the whole sooty thing. Um, and, and John developed some scenarios for Sooty and Panto uh, and it just worked really well and I've, you know it's, it's been there ever since it, it really fits because it's one of those characters that everybody knows so um, it's a good one John Conway always had a, a phrase casting the poster casting the poster <laughs> and it's good it looks great on the poster Sooty because oh yeah I know that grandparents are often bringing their kids they remember Sooty they know it's going to tick the kids box kids who watch it they know Sooty it's a, it's a good strong family wholesome thing um, so it fits very well I never put sweep or I've never encouraged the use of sweep on the poster I always put sweep in the panto because they love him <laughs> and to bring him out unexpectedly when you're least expecting him is great, particularly if you think it's a baddie, gonna, you know, the baddie's entrance, big heavy footsteps and that calamity cord and that around the corner. <laughs> you know, the audience, oh no, what are you doing here? You know, you're not supposed to be in this. You're not on the poster. You know, I'll give it all that. And um, <laughs> yeah, so yeah, it's a good fit. Sweep then. He's the more vocal of the two, yeah. shall I say. And Sweep, he's... Um, he appeals to that cheeky boy in everybody, doesn't he? He does. He does. Um, <laughs> you think he's, he's actually over there. I can go and get him if you want. There we are. Look. Can you hear the footsteps as I go across the room? <laughs> I actually keep them. I keep them always here with me in the office. So this is where I write the show. And, uh, and I can't write the shows, especially the TV shows, unless they're here. I put them on, bless them. They come alive and then they sort of do the routines themselves and I write them up. It's weird. It, it's like you develop a sort of a... Uh, a, 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 they become when I mean we have to talk technical here, but when Sooty's on my hand, he he does things before I know he's going to do them. It, it's the weirdest thing, and I, then I can write the routine up. Like if I've got this pen and paper here now, you know, here's pen and paper. Now if I, I'm just talking off the top of my head, but if I want to do a routine when I'm trying to write a letter and Sooty keeps removing the pen or making it difficult for me, I can't do it. Unless, big moment, come on up little fella, here he is. Now if I've got him on my hand, here he is, tap the microphone, he's really, if I've got him on my hand and I'm trying to write, will you just put that up, I can do the routine, but I can't write it without him, so I, I do keep them handy. And this is the one you're all waiting for. Give us a moment, right there. Okay. Okay, come on up then. <laughs> There we are, that's sweet. Say hello to everybody. 
That's it. See? You know what? In Panto, I for years I've had sweep singing Ness and Dorma. He comes up and there's a he comes up wearing the hanky, uh, wearing the little uh, Pavarotti suit, and we got a full orchestration of Ness and Dorma, so it sounds amazing. And he sort of does this thing. I'll try and do a bit of it. <laughs> anyway, he does this. 30 seconds of Lesson Dorma and it always rocks the hat I mean it always rocks the place and often many times the reviews you know they, they've spent fortunes on flying coaches and ponies and waterfalls and blah blah and the reviewers have put a highlight of the show was sweep singing Lesson Dorma it's this silly little thing with a farty blower squeaking uh, but the audience love it you know yeah there you go so you've seen him here he is he's gone very quiet now for some reason he can't talk when I talk for some bizarre strange reason he's such a cutie though isn't he well, they both are. Look at them. Let's get them out. Here they are. Sooty and sweep. Perfect double act. There they are. Look. There we go. They're great. Very quiet at the moment. And because uh, I've uh, not squeaking. But there they are. Yeah, they're amazing. And it's a privilege to work with them. What's going to happen then when there's this time when you pass on the baton? Do you know what? A lot of people have asked me that. I mentioned earlier my association with the fairground business. And they do say old showmen don't retire, they just die on the job, you know, they just die doing it. Um, and that's true. If you go to a fairground and look, you'll often see the, the granddad or the great great granddad in the coconut shy, you know, they don't retire showmen. It's just not something they, their world does at 65 or whatever. So I won't retire. So I'm going to be extremely selfish with Sutton and Sweet. <laughs> and if anyone thinks they're going to jump in and have the baton, they can wait until I'm in a box. Because I love them too much. I treat them like my kids. Um, there may be occasions where I feel, you know, if, like sometimes I don't present all my stage shows. I physically have so many. I, I've got a couple of good presenters that stand in and, and do my stuff. Um, and they do it brilliantly. And the children actually don't matter as long as they get sooty. They don't mind as long as they get sooty and sweet. So there might be a time when maybe I'll let someone else present them. But I won't ever stop, I don't think. I, I don't think I could. It's too much a part of me now. It was such a lovely nod as well in the series when you had Matthew back mm. a while ago. Yes. He's a great friend, Matthew Corbett, and a great supporter. And we speak often. And I felt that was a good thing to include him. Sooty went through a, a, a weird phase with the new owners once Matthew retired. They tried to take it in a different direction to sell it globally and it didn't really work. So it had gone off off the rails, in my opinion, which is why ITV stopped commissioning it for a time and that's why the rights were sold. Um, and I was speaking to Matthew throughout that era and I'm going to quote him now because it's historic. He did say if my father could see what was happening now, he'd turn in his grave because the way they changed the dynamics of... It wasn't the Sooty Show anymore. Mm. Um, they tried to do what they thought was best, but in doing so had destroyed the very element that made it work, hence ITV decommissioning. So one of the criteria for getting it back on the air was just to putting it back as it was, just to restoring that classic double-act slapstick scenario with the adult in the middle of it getting all the pies and trying to keep control and losing, losing control helplessly. Um, so I felt that in order to put it back on track I said to Matthew if I you know will you come and be on it he said of course I will you know if you're doing it we'll, and and he came back so it was it was a way of saying to the hardcore fans don't worry we, we, we're gonna get it right now because they knew it was mm. off, off the rails yeah a safe pair of hands in the nicest possible way yeah <laughs> We'd, yeah there's definitely a joke <laughs> there somewhere but but I, I'd like to think so I mm. do love them and you've got to love them yeah I'm in your office now and there are Lots and lots of jokes. Have you always been a bit of a joker? Well, by jokes, you mean that they are uh, practical jokes. Practical they're, they're not jokes. sort of gags, verbal gags. Mm. They're, they're all um, jokes from the 1960s, 70s, 80s, 90s that you would find in a joke shop. Joke shops don't really exist anymore, but they're all in their original packaging. None of them have been opened, and I've collected these for many years. I find them on eBay and, and, and in some weird sort of places um and the reason for this is when I was uh, a little boy I didn't get pocket money my dad took me down to the joke shop on a Saturday afternoon and I could pick a you know a squirting camera or a stink bomb or something or a magic trick often and uh, I do live in my childhood I love my childhood I was blessed with wonderful parents who encouraged me I had an amazing childhood 
So when I come into my office, I surround my things, my, myself with things from my childhood. So I have probably the most extensive collection of unopened practical jokes anywhere. I've got my bubblegum machines, which are full of toys and vintage things from the, the 70s, which the little toy vending machines. And my pinball machine over there is one that I had since I was 12. And again, my little ventriloquist dolls, my DJ decks from when I was about 16, 17. Everything, yeah, it's like going back in time when I come into my office, but I feel very comfortable here. You know, this is sort of my little bubble. <laughs> what was your favourite joke to play on people then? And do you still <laughs> play jokes on people now? Uh, occasionally. <laughs> I think the funniest recent encounter with a joke, I've, I'm, I used to walk, there's a famous magician and a famous actor called Andy Nyman. And I walked to school with Andy Nyman for many years. And we are very close friends. And there was a squirting chocolate gag which was a plastic piece of chocolate, which looked like the most unreal bit of chocolate. You'd, ever, you'd never see a chocolate that looked like that ever. But you filled it up with water and you'd say to someone, would you like some of this chocolate? And of course they'd hopefully say yes. And you squeezed it and it would squirt them with water. So anyway, I had one in the, in the packet and I was at Andy's house and I went, oh, I bought, because he collects these sort of things as well. And I said, oh, I've got these, some, look, this fake chocolate as if anyone would ever you know, fall for it. But I thought you might like it. I've got several of them and I gave him one, I think. And um, later on that evening, he'd taken it out, filled it with water, and he went, oh, um, got these new chocolates. I don't know if you like one. I said, oh, yeah, I'd like one. <laughs> and he soaked me with it. And oh, no, I've just fallen for my own crap practical joke. So that was my, I think the squirting chocolate will be my favourite, just because it's the worst ever produced practical joke, and I <laughs> fell for it. So there you are. What kind of magic shops then and joke shops were you going to when you were a little kid? Well, they the, the don't think they exist in the way they used to, but there was one in Leicester called um, the House of Fun. And it was not even really in the city centre to start with. It moved there eventually. It was just like on a side street. You know, you've got to remember, I'm, I'm 52 now and, and I'm from an era when you made your own entertainment and you didn't have a phone or even TV was pretty primitive. So a yeah, practical joke would give me a week's worth of nonsense. It would work <laughs> its way around on a Saturday afternoon. My parents would get it on the, after my dad had come back from the joke shop. My father would have to feign surprise, even though he <laughs> knew what it was. Then on Sunday, we'd go and see my nan and, and her friends. They'd all get it on a Sunday. Then everybody in school would get it from Monday to Friday. And then next Saturday came on and come up with something new, you know. <laughs> so um, it was, yeah, it was a source of great entertainment for my childhood these snappy gums and you know fault dog turds and <laughs> things like that whoopee cushions yeah you name it how's your lockdown been then crazy uh not in a good way crazy um i was very lucky in as much as i had a really full date sheet sooty keeps me very busy um, which is great so beginning of the year I had a, a tour flat out with a theater tour till about may uh, then we were moving into um, pre-production for a television series uh, and some summer work, some some gigs and things. TV series was to be shot. Uh, pre-production starts straight away. It's shot in September. Then after that, moving into a magic show tour, which is nothing to do with Sooty, called Extreme Magic. And then after that, into Panto. So all of that cancelled, you know, just gone, as everybody else has had the same problems. Full date sheet, nothing, zero. So... I found that quite tough. First time in my life I've never been running at a million miles an hour with projects on the go. Uh, as you can see, we're, I'm blessed with a beautiful house in this lovely location, but it's quite remote. Um, so suddenly, you know, a lot of time on your hands. It, it's very weird. Uh, so I redecorated the house and did it again and moved things around and can only do that for so much, so, so long. Um, so it, it, it's, it's not been, for me, it doesn't, you know, it, it hasn't been... A happy time really I'm gonna to be totally honest you be talking honestly mm. it's been uh, really weird but I did buy behind me you can look at there's a trick there which looks nothing more than a pair of step ladders and a plank on it I did buy that and a, and a hoop I did buy that illusion and I think it's the most practiced illusion in the history of my career <laughs> because it's quite small in size but it's a great effect and one of only 25 built like that by that builder in the world uh, it was built by an American guy called Walter Blaney. So I just practiced that endlessly to the music, had music scored and everything. And I was just practicing imaginarily talking to people from the audience. Now, lie on this plank and I'm going to... So I practiced that forever. Um, so that was a big focal point, but that's the only performing I've done and a few online sort of video things. But, but yeah, it's been difficult. Mm. Are you going to miss Christmas this year in Panto? Very, I think 
anyone in Panto land is going to miss Panto. I'm blessed in as much that there is a sooty Christmas show which exists and is ready to go at the drop of a hat if something changes but it's not Panto I do sooty all year long the great thing with Panto is I get to do my big illusions again it's my opportunity to play with these big props that I've got which I now own again so that I'll miss um, I was going to go to Southampton play buttons which is my favorite of all roles because you get the pathos which I love I love to play that for real which I don't get to do with any other character so that was a big plus and it's Kudos's Palladium set it's Southampton you know and and to do all of that I was looking forward to it and I'm you know I'm close friends with Debbie McGee who's a fairy godmother so it was oh it's Debbie you know I knew it would be a great Christmas um so yeah, I'm, I'm mortified. Obviously it's post been postponed, so I get to do it, hopefully, all things being equal, 14, 15 months down the line. But I don't know what I'll do at Christmas. It's gonna be so weird. I mean, hopefully I'll be doing something, but if I'm not, I'll just be having a turkey and watching TV and doing what everyone else has done forever. <laughs> and I've never done, ever. I've never, ever, ever not worked Panto, ever, since I was 15, or the Sooty Christmas show for a couple of years, which is Panto-esque. Mm. I've never, ever not worked. Ever. That's really sad. <laughs> it's sad for a lot of people. The ones I feel for most is some of the dames. That is... You know, they spend all year prepping those costumes and for them that is the highlight of their year. I mean, I'm lucky I get to perform all year round and I'm basically Richard slash Button slash this character is basically mm. me whatever. But for those guys that, that, that become this alter ego at Christmas and get to show off their work, particularly if they make their own frocks or design them, most dames have a hand in, in some kind of creation of what they're going to wear. Um, I know they're going to look at those frocks gathering dust and they're going to find it hard. You know, for some people it is their big highlight of the year. It's a highlight for me, but I have lots of others, thankfully, to look forward to, usually. So, uh, it could be worse. So I feel for them. Mm. You said about bringing out the big props that you love to do the magic with. Do you remember what your first big illusion was? Absolutely. Well, it depends what you mean by big. There's lots of kind of mid-range girl, girl in box type tricks. But for me, and there's a picture of it up there, which won't mean anything to your listeners, but there is me sat on a motorcycle. Um, I'm 22. Britain's first illusion is to vanish and reappear a motorcycle in midair. Um, I put that because of my dear friend, Fred and Andrew, friends, Fred and Andrew Van Buren, who did a vanishing motorcycle, but they didn't lift it in the air. They did a completely different version, which was brilliant in its own way. So that, for me, is always going to be my favourite illusion. It was my first big, big prop. So it, it was, you know, full-on motorcycle, driving into a cage, cage hoisted above, you know, 20 foot into the air, cage falls apart, leaves nothing, bike vanishes instantly, I ride in from the back of the audience. And that was the trick which actually catapulted me into those great summer seasons for the likes of Kudos, AMG and Barry Stead and all those people. That trick was why they booked me, because it was a showstopper. It was. I'm not saying it because I'm... It just was. And I remember doing the Blackpool Grand Season, and that was the finale. And, <laughs> and it, we went straight from the me appearing into the rock and roll finale number, and that was the finale. Um, and there was a few, I forget who was in the show, Chucker Brothers, the Nolans, sort of people like that. And I remember saying to Paul and Barry, Chucker, doesn't that bother you? I mean, I didn't put John Conway directed the show. I didn't place it there. It had nothing to do with me. He said, no, he said, it doesn't bother us. He said, because they couldn't follow it. It was so big and the audience was so <laughs> restless. He said, no, he said, I remember Paul Chucker saying, no, it doesn't bother me. He said, because they won't remember you who you are. They'll just come out saying, hey, that Chucker Brothers show was good. <laughs> oh, yeah, okay, fair enough. <laughs> Many a true word. But, yeah, so that's my favourite all-time trick. How did you afford it then when you were that so young? Uh, I didn't, is the answer. How did I afford that? I mean, I'm lucky now. I've got some beautiful props built mm. from America, and, and, and I'm lucky now I can afford to have beautiful props 
It's one of the benefits of getting a bit older and saving a few quid. But at the time, I couldn't. So I had the fun fair. I was living in a caravan, lived in a caravan until I was 28, lived in a caravan with my brother. We had nothing. And we had the uh, fun fair and basically candy floss and hold tight riders paid for that trick. I borrowed money. The guy that built the cage let me owe him money. Um, yeah, it was, I was d determined to do it. Nothing, it didn't matter that I was living in a caravan. I remember it being so cold in the caravan that the fairy liquid froze because I couldn't afford any gas. I had a, a, a Space Invaders machine in a cafe, which I used to go and sit in the cafe and wait for someone to play it so I could take the money out of it to go and buy food. I mean, it, I'm not being poverty. I'm, I, it never, at the time, it didn't feel like poverty. I was just in love with what I was doing, you know? So I would happily have gone without a house and a, a flat and a, 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 a beat up old van, you know, because I was, I was buying, I was going to vanish a motorcycle. What more, <laughs> what more mattered? You know, literally that was our mm. thinking. Same with the rides business. We went without so many things to have a nice ride or put lights on them or have a better music system. Me and my brother, it never occurred to us we were living rough, which we were. We were just living with no money, you know. We were living on baked beans when Tesco had that offer and it was 5p a can or something. We went and bought hundreds of cans of baked beans, you know. But you do it when you're young. You, you're young and full of it. And yeah, so I... Couldn't bait. I don't know how I afforded it, but I just scraped, begged and borrowed and sold lots of candy floss. When I sold my amusement park, I thought, I'm going to treat myself. Me and my brother both can treat myself. So I always promised myself I'm going to buy myself a Mercedes SL 500 AMG with all the kit on it. You know? mm. So I went and test drove one. It was £114,000. And I got out of the car and I thought, that's absolutely bloody ridiculous. It's just a car. What am I thinking? I could buy a house, you know. Hmm. What on earth was I thinking? And I thought, well, I'm going to treat myself. I thought, I know what I'll have. I'll buy an illusion just because I had sold them all and I loved them a bit like this one. I'm going to buy an illusion and I'll shoehorn it into the Sooty Stage Show just because I can, you know, <laughs> just so I can do it. And there was a trick that I wanted called a slicer where a girl gets in it, you tip the box up and you pull the box. And it's really expensive. I could never afford one, ever because they were always like 16 grand back in the day. I mean, they were always crazy, because there's really technical, there's a lot, of, the inventor has to be paid and it's all, blah, blah, blah. and nobody would make one in this country because they're too complicated. So I found the best illusion builder in the world, which is called Illusion Projects, they make all David Copperfield's illusions, and Cirque du Soleil, and I said, hello, oh, I'd like to order a slicer, please. And all the <laughs> we don't build for magicians, we don't build one-offs, we build whole shows, so we'll build a show so we don't just build props really we're not the people for that I said but I know you build them because I know yes but we don't we, we build a yeah. okay I said well if do you have a gap because you could build one I said, cause, I said well we'll take your name and if we ever do but we won't but we'll take it anyway mm -hmm. I said okay it's Richard Cadell and she said well you've already bought off us I said I never bought anything off you in my life she said well your name's on our system I said well I've never bought a thing she said hang on a minute then the voice comes on the phone. It's an English-speaking male voice. And he goes, Richard. Uh, yeah, it's, it's Tim. Tim Clothier. Tim Clothier I taught magic to when he was a child. He won the Young Magician of the Year with an act I taught him. He'd subsequently gone out to Las Vegas, aged 18, started working as a props guy on a magic show and developed illusion projects and is now the biggest, most successful illusion builder in the world. It's his company. So he said, of course I'll build you a slicer. I went, I don't believe this, Tim. I, I said, no, I've never heard of you again. He said, well, well you know, I'm an American now. Why would you hear me? I don't have any family in, you know, this is, I've got family out here now and this is what I do. I build all Copperfield stuff and all that. So consequently, I went out to Las Vegas. I bought a slicer. And now I've got an inroad to Tim's thing. So everyone's saying, how did you get Tim Clancy to build you a slicer? Well... <laughs> So I bought a slicer and then I thought, okay, I'm going to have a motorcycle appearance and then I'm going to have a water tank where I escape and, and, and it's gone on and on and I've had a floating pedal car with Sooty and I've had a d double soaring in half and the chainsaw massacre and, and, and I've got something else he's building for a minute for Extreme Magic where chainsaw's going to look like it's going to cut my head off. That's in the <laughs> workshop now. So I have spent far in excess of the Mercedes SL500. <laughs> but um, yeah, so, so yeah, so, so I've got, when you say I've got magic, I've got just loads of, beautiful illusions which is like an indulgence but I do them all in panto I get to play with them not all of them but I get to do that's what it is playing with them oh, and that, that's it. It, it the second you start getting too serious oh, yeah. and it's cheesy music it's all cheesy 
everything like that because I do I don't care I'm not trying to I'm not trying to be modern and contemporary I do you know this is what it is I mean now everyone Britain got talent of all these huge props um, but if you saw me at Winter Wonderland you'll see some of the stuff that I bought then from America I've got even more now that's um, I did a thing at the Magic one of the biggest shows I did there's 5,000 magicians basically go to this convention and, 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 and they have the best from all around the world and I closed the gala show on the Saturday night with all my big illusions doesn't mean I'm the best it just means they always close with an illusion act and it just happened to be me but it was I mean the, I, the poster's somewhere and it, I was given like top billing over these massive names of magic so it was just, for me to do that was incredible and I, I, I developed a trick which I developed for Winter Wonderland I was bloody awful at Winter Wonderland but we actually did get it right in the end and worked out how to present it which is a thing with a water tank and the magicians just freaked over it because they couldn't work it out it was, it was you know it's a magician's trick really but anyway so I, I closed the show at the Blackpool Magic Convention with all the illusions so in the middle of the bloody act you know I'm doing that music stops they bring on a prop <laughs> sooty pops on big reaction and I just remember saying what are you doing here you're not supposed to be here you know, what's that you paid for it all okay fair enough and then it got a big laugh huge laugh because yeah. it was the truth <laughs> <laughs> you know so we got and then I carried on with the illusion so what's next then for sooty haha <laughs> Well, 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 well. It was your inner Danny coming out then, wasn't it? Oh, was that my inner Danny? Ha <laughs> ha! <laughs> Everybody's done that 25 years. You know, they all do that, don't they? Bless Danny. Bless Danny. My first ever meet with Danny, I had to go and talk him into. To, he sort of retired from doing panto. Barry said, said, You go down to Tunbridge Wells, you meet him, um, and see if you can talk him into doing panto. He's a big draw, you know. That you just see if we can get him out of retirement to do it. He said, Buy him a bottle of champagne, he'll love it. I said, Okay. So I got to Tunbridge Wells, he was already there. He got there early. Oh, hello there. The champagne's already on the table. I said, oh, um, yeah, I was going to get the champagne. Don't worry, I've already got it. I put it on your bill. <laughs> <laughs> so he'd already, he was ahead of it. Whatever it was, 100 quid or something. Yeah, okay, okay. I'm, I'm on the wavelength of it now. I get it. Um, anyway, sorry. Diversifying. What did you ask me? I can't it, remember. It now. was about what's what's happening next to his city. But go on, tell us about this meeting with, um, with Danny then. How did you persuade him to go back? Oh, out of he, oh, it was easy. I just bought him lunch and, and he told me his life story. Um, yeah, uh, and it was fascinating. He didn't need a lot of cajoling at all. Um, yeah, it was more about how much, <laughs> you know, it was actually <laughs> at that point. But no, he, he was a joy. Um, yeah, yeah. I mean, everyone's got Danny stories. I could go, they, they, we're going to get into a lot of, a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, time if we go off on one. But yeah, he was, uh, it was interesting, and Annie was with him, of course, who, you know, really was the saviour of that whole relationship, I think, or, the, or or Danny's ability to perform. She kept him in tow. Not only did she forever op let the costumes out as he got bigger, um, but she sort of disciplined him a bit as well when he could he could be a bit grand sometimes. But uh, he was a legend, you know, um, and, and he was a legend. He would come on stage and say whatever he liked. Just would say whatever he liked. <laughs> I mean, I remember on the opening, I actually said to him because I knew he was quite elderly and I didn't want him to feel exerted. And we were doing three shows a day some days. I said, "Look, Danny, we're going to keep your entrances really short and sharp. You don't have to be on for long. You just, you just really short and sharp because then it'll make them special and you don't feel that you've. I don't want to tie you out. That's all right, Ali. So he learned the words. He never learned the words. So his opening route still, you know, we did a big <laughs> opening, Queen Daniela, and on a fairy sort of flash pot, and there he would be a performing appear and he had sort of like a minute's worth of well here we are in fairyland it's here for my desire and here we are to stony brook we go and it was like we never got that <laughs> so i'm sat there in the opening sort of night and i'm with a couple of press people and my jaw sort of begins to hit the floor after into the fourth minute Bless him. And he said, well, here I am in Croyd. And it's a lovely to see you. This is, we haven't heard this. Another, we've never heard this before. What's this? <laughs> and it's a lovely place. And I'm looking down from the sky as a fairy. And I'm seeing all the people of Croyd. And, and I'm thinking, come on, just say Stony Broke. Get us to Stony Broke, please, Danny. You know, we're like, please. So he said, right, then I'm... I think I ought to go now. <laughs> I've got EastEnders on in the dressing room. Barbara Windsor's done very well, hasn't she? I'm coming, Barbara! Exit. Somebody lift the cloth. Oh, yeah, it's Stony Broke. I thought, well, we're never going to get. We're never going to get. So you never knew what you were going to get. But the audience loved him.
You know, they loved him. So you sort of stand back and think, okay, all right, well, they're paying the tickets. You know, <laughs> if they're happy, I'm not going to change it. Um, I can't give him any notes because I'm just, it's not going to happen. So we've, we've signed up for this. So, um, yeah, but he was, he was Danny and that's what the audience wanted. So everybody went, everybody was happy. Yeah. Sooty then. Yeah. <laughs> What's next for What's him? The, yeah, back to the original question. Well, we, we had a TV series uh, scheduled for this year that got put back with the COVID thing. So that was a bit of a oops moment. So we're going to shoot that now in June next year. That's very exciting. I have the theatre tour kicking off early next year, which is a pickup of the tour that was cancelled this year. So hopefully, again, that will kick in as normal. Let's hope by March that the world has returned to a place. I mean, the good thing is with the Sooty Show, it's actually it's only me and three puppeteers and one of them sells the merchandise. So as a show, we can afford to maybe work to uh, socially distance audiences. It's not ideal. but So I don't think we'll be cancelling. I'd sooner work to half an audience than not work at all mm. um so just to keep my mind you know <laughs> sane i suppose but so we're doing that and then there has been talk i'm almost embarrassed to say this because there's been talk of many years and lots of near misses with a movie a full-on sooty movie which is the most brilliant script that's been put together and makes a lot of commercial sense but my journey into the movie world has been you know like a literally a roller coaster um, you just meet these weird characters. It's not like TV. I, I produced the TV series. ITV said, there's the money, bang. And I say, there's the series. And they put it on. It's easy. With a movie and cinemas and, oh, my goodness, all the crooks involved. There's a whole business for failed movies. It's an industry. They want to make a movie that they know is never going to see the light of day because as long as they get paid along the way, that's all they want. They're not interested in the long term. Of course, here's me saying, look, I want this to be a very successful, high-profile release. You know, I don't want something in a bargain bucket or something that's never seen. And it has to be good because it's sooty. So there's all these crooks I've met along the way and it's took a few years. But finally, finally, the stars seem to have aligned. And if they have aligned in the way I think they might have done, we'll be shooting that. Hey, August and September for a Christmas release. It's going to be a real fast turnaround because it doesn't take long now. They're going to literally be cutting and editing as we go because that's the way to produce this on budget. That This is the big problem is raising the money, getting enough money. It was always that we got halfway there. We're talking millions to produce a good movie. So you get halfway there, but you just haven't got that final million, you know, which is a ridiculous amount. Well, you know, um, now fortunately we're in a position whereby we might be able to make it for less, given the people that are on board. And that means it'll happen. So I'm kind of like, oh, OK, we better block some time out here. So maybe Sooty will be, you know, on the big screen by Christmas. But if not, um, I was down to do the Extreme Magic Show, which has got nothing to do with Sooty. So I'll do that and then jump in with Sooty and Sweep and all the nonsense in Cinderella at Southampton. So that's what we got lined up next year. Is there anything that you'd still like to be able to do? Do you know, I'm really lucky. I'm very content. I've had a wonderful career. I always dreamt of being on children's television. Well, you know, I couldn't really have exceeded my expectations with Sooty. That's, that's off the scale, really. Um, I've done my own magic show. I've worked for magicians. I've, 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 I've done a great deal. So I'm very content and, and I'm, I now enjoy everything. I didn't when I was younger. I was so ambitious. I was always thinking of the next job, the next season, the next pantomime, bigger part, you know, big, more of illusions. I now stand back when I'm in those pantomimes or on the stage and think, wow, how lucky, what, what am I, how lucky am I to do this? Like I say, I love every second of walking out on the stage. It's a privilege. How lucky to do that. Contentment is a great thing. So I'm at that point where I just, I think I've got nothing to prove anymore. I'm not going to get any better. This is as good as it gets. <laughs> I'm not going to improve particularly. I've, I've peaked. So I'm just lucky to still be able to, you know, at 52, walk on and shout, hi, kids. <laughs> I was really upset, actually. A friend of mine who's a young actor and a brilliant actor, a professional actor, said, um, well, but very actor, what are you playing on Christmas? I said, I'm going to be Buttons in uh, Cinderella at Nottingham. Oh, and how old is, uh, uh, how old is the girl playing Cinderella? I don't know, um, 20, something like that, 22. Oh, wouldn't that be a bit weird? What do you mean? Well, a man of your age telling me that you love her and that you really fancy her. I went, 
well, I never thought of it like that. Don't <laughs> shatter my illusions. I want to be playing buttons forever, you know? I don't. What do you mean? Probably in the real theatre it might, but it's panto. You, you can do it, can't mm. you? So hopefully I'll keep on. You've got youthful doing... looks, though. That's the thing. I never believed you were 52, and I'm not blowing smoke or anything, but you don't look 52. Well, that's very kind. Yeah. What can I say? Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. I'll cut that bit out. <laughs> One thing you are known for, being the ambassador for City, is how you spend the time with your fans after the show. How important is that to you? It's really important. Um, and I learnt this from Paul and Barry Chuckle. I did two or three years touring with them. And they were the masters of meeting every child after the show. And I remember Barry Chuckle saying to me, if you want children to let you into their bedroom and their front rooms and be part of their world, then when they want to see you, you've got to be there. And I thought, you're absolutely right. So I always thought when I got the job of Sooty, I am going to do what the Chuckles did and I'm going to sit there with Sooty till every last kid has seen it. And, you know, I enjoy that more than the show because they all want to talk to Sooty. They want to put their arms around Sooty and the parents get more giggly than the kids sometimes that it's Sooty. Um, but I love it. I love it. They bring little presents for Sooty. They bring presents for Sweep and Sue that Sooty give to them and little drawings and they have their picture taken. And then now they're bringing pictures of me saying, look, this is me having my picture taken with you when I was three. And now this is my child. No, no, no. <laughs> Don't do that. Don't do that. Um, so, so it's nice. It's real important, and I'm privileged that I can do it easily. It's easy to have Sooty in the little box and sit there and do it. Um, and, yeah, so I, I owe that to the Chucker brothers for watching them and, and looking at how much it meant to the children to meet them. So, yeah, that's where that comes from. And the tiredness after a show and things like this, you just... Well, you know what? I think I owe that to the fairground. I don't get tired. And when I did, uh, a few years ago, I did Winter Wonderland in Hyde Park and did the Sooty Christmas show. And then I did the circus afterwards. I did my illusions in the circus. So I was doing five shows a day and I did that for seven weeks without a day off. So that's hard work. But I get my mentality from the fairground because actually it's, you know, I used to have dart stools and cam stools and shooting ranges. And when you've done that for 12 hours and you're continually saying, come on, have a go, and not one down, you nearly done it, have another go. And you, you're, you're talking them into spending money, but you're trying to entertain them at the same time because if you keep them smiling, they'll keep spending, bluntly. God, that sounds so, so calculated and fickle, doesn't it? But it's the truth. So that gives you the stamina to keep that up. So that fairground mentality, that grafting mentality, is um, I, 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 I akin to the fairground. I hope Stephen Mulhern wouldn't mind me saying this, but he's another one that does it. Now, his parents come from a grafting background. They, they, they were grafters. They sold things. They had stalls and shops and things. And I know his mentality is from that. He's another one that sticks it because you've just got that kind of, we just go until we, we keep going. It's, it's not a, I'm so tired, darling. You know, it's none of that. It's, <laughs> it's just, it's kind of a, a grafting view point. Do you get the Panto Blues? When it's over, yeah. yeah, I always cry. Always cry on the last curtain. Because I love it, always cry. No shame in crying, I'm a big crier. Yeah, I cried at Nottingham. I cried at Wolverhampton the year before. Um, yeah, it's a fairy tale world, isn't it? I'm buttons for, for four weeks. You know, I'm in love with Cinderella and I'm part of that world. I, make, I take her to the ball and <laughs> you've got, I, I know I'm 52, but I'm still in love with I'm still in love with that world. That little boy's still there, isn't he? Absolutely. And I don't want it to ever, ever not be there. Like I say, you know, you've got to remember anyone that's a performer that's listening to this, you're changing children's lives. You're giving them magic in a world that may be challenging for them. You don't know what their home life is like. And they come to that imaginary world and suddenly everything's fabulous and there's a happy ending and there's prizes and laughs and spectacle and music and... And you're part of delivering that. Never forget that. It's sometimes performers think all about their own performances, and yeah, forget that. Just those are the theatre-going audience of tomorrow. They're the performers of tomorrow. You know, I go back to what I said earlier: the little girl in the audience watching Cinderella go to the ball. You know, she might be in twenty years' time sat on that coach and ponies, flying over an audience. Who knows? Well, this leads me on to my last question your dream pantomime 
So you can be in it, you can be sitting in the stalls watching it, you can choose the venue, and the cast can be alive or dead. Do you know what? Um, it would be quite easy of me, I think, here to sit here and, and cherry pick a cast of the greats, particularly people that, that had died before I got a chance to see them, Billy Dainty, people like that. Um, from those great Emil Littler pantomimes, those hand bills that you look at as historic bills. I'd love to have seen those huge pantos with massive casts and, you know, all the Tiller girls and all that stuff. I'd have loved to have been part of that. But the happiest pantomime I ever did was for Brian Geary when I was 17, 18. And I played Buttons for Brian in the most beautiful production of Cinderella with that team of amateurs I would love to take that cast and put them on a big stage with all those wonderful things that Kudos have developed and other producers have developed so we could all have a bloody good time one more time that was my happiest ever buttons that was my happiest ever experience in Panto because everybody was there for love nobody was being paid we were all there for love and Brian was there throwing everything at it. Big orchestra, you know, it was a dream. And, and, and I look back on that with so much affection. That would be my dream cast. The names would mean nothing to you or to people listening, but those that were part of it or new people will know who I'm talking about. Yeah, I'd like to do it all again. One more time with that cast. Have you still got photos of that before? Yes, I have. <laughs> and, and, the, and the bill did they have a poster for oh it? no I don't think it wasn't that sort of show because there was no names in it um, I could probably dig out some pictures and a programme if not I know people that will have them um, there's a little routine that Brian Geary insisted I did in that panto and I didn't want to do it I was a proper teenager oh this is rubbish <laughs> you know um and it's great. And do you know, I've done it so many times since. And the last time I did it was with Sooty. And I've introduced it into the Sooty show. So it goes right back to when I was 17. And it's a routine that Danny Kaye did in a film. And I forget the name of the film, but you can Google the, the and see it on YouTube. It's called Five Little Pennies. And you give a child five pennies and each penny means something. It's a little song. And basically, it's basically the song, the essence of the song is if you've got five pence, it's not about the money. It's about what each if you've got if you've got what each of these pennies mean, you've, you're a millionaire. You've got everything. It's a beautiful little song. And I used to do it as buttons. I do all the gags and that, the callback gag. And then you fish one, one kid doesn't get a present. So I'll give you five pence and sing the song. And Brian made me do it. It was a showstopper. And I've done it so many times in Panto. People say, what's that song? I said, it's a Danny Kaye song. It's old fashioned, but we, we've kind of modernised it. And the last time I did it with Sooty, and he produced the pennies on the end of his magic wand for the little child. So there's a routine there that, that, that was given to me, forced upon me in that show, which has lived throughout my whole life. And I think probably when I go off in the box, there's certain people will probably chuck five pennies in because that's been such an instrumental routine for me. That's thanks to Brian Geary. Well, Richard, Sooty and Sweep, <laughs> I, I think it's time we said goodbye to everybody. Here's Sweep, hang on. Oh, that was goodbye. <laughs> All right, we're going to say goodbye. You know, um, there's a few catchphrases with Sooty. Of course, Izzy Wizzy, let's get busy. Mm. But of course, at the end of the show, it's always been the same sort of goodbye, hasn't it? So we ought to do it in Shall five we stars. Goodbye? Well, Sweep can't say goodbye. He's going to, if I do it, Sweep can't. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, it was the same. You know, you, you picture this scenario. We always finished the episode or Harry Corbett used to have the egg running down his face, you know, and Matthew would be covered in cement. And, and I always try and finish in some form of complete distress, which is the whole formula of the show. And you look down the lens and you painfully say, yeah, with a little bit of love in your voice, because you can't be angry with this little teddy bear. And Harry Corbett na nailed it, just the inflection. So I hope I can do it tribute. So with sincerity and love, but pain at the same time, I'm saying bye-bye, everybody. Bye-bye.